Good morning to all of you. I'm uh, happy to be here with you to share our experiences in addressing uh, our security threats, internal security threats uh, in our country, in the Philippines. So let me proceed now with uh, my presentation. It's about the internal peace and security plan by Anihan, our campaign to uh, win the peace in our country. Let me just uh, present to you some background there on uh, our campaign plan. Uh, our long experience in addressing internal security threats has uh, made us realize that uh, a lot of things, but more importantly, that a purely military solution is inadequate in addressing these threats, as these are multifaceted and involves a lot of aspects outside the military. And therefore, the solution cannot be purely military, and it, there is a need for complementary and concerted of all stakeholders to peace. Among its uh, salient features, uh, this plan is an open document, open to everybody. In fact, in the formulation of this plan, we involve our different stakeholders, and therefore there is uh, co-ownership of this plan, and uh, our stakeholders are co-authors to this plan. And uh, even from the planning implementation phase and implementation phase, we involved our stakeholders. This plan is anchored on our overall peace framework based on our national peace and security uh, guidances and policies and uh, in harmony with all our uh, strategic and policy directions. As mentioned earlier, this plan is focused on winning the peace. It's a paradigm shift. We have always, uh, in the military, been introduced to defeating the enemy. But in the case of internal security operations, you're going after your own people. And so, makes us think, do we really defeat them? Or do we win them over? Do we win the peace for our people? So that dilemma has been uh, our consideration in crafting this plan. It's a paradigm shift in, in, in the sense that it embraces the broader frame of human security where the uh, task of the armed forces of protecting the people and protecting the state has to be balanced. They are not actually contradictory. In fact, they are mutually supporting. Protecting the people, our people, and protecting the state goes hand in hand. And in this plan, there is equal emphasis on both combat and non-combat dimensions of uh, military operations. So let me start by introducing to you the, the mission of this uh, campaign. The Armed Forces of the Philippines conducts support operations. Uh, note that it is support operations, given that this plan involves a whole of nation approach, a whole of society approach, where the armed forces supports the national endeavor to win the peace in order to help the Filipino nation create an environment conducive for sustainable development and just and lasting peace. Its end state is so that the threats capability are reduced, so that they no longer threaten the stability of the state and civil authorities can assume the responsibility of ensuring the safe, safety and well-being of our people. There are six objectives. Contribute to the success of the peace process. Maintain a professional armed forces under firm democratic control. Defeat the terrorist groups. Contribute to the resolution of other conflicts. Contribute to the establishment of conditions to allow civil authorities to take responsibility for the safety and well-being of our people. 
and support development initiatives. In this plan, we identified some desired effects, and there are three of them focused on the three threat groups, the principal threat groups that we face. And let me just talk about these three uh, threat groups briefly. The first is the Communist New People's Army National Democrat Democratic Front. It's a communist-inspired insurgency with uh, the intent of uh, overthrowing the government and supplanting it with a communist state. We've been addressing this for more than 40 years already. And they are found all over the country. Although at this time, they are now reduced to the southern, southeastern part of the Philippines. And then we have the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, uh, an Islamic movement uh, intending to secede from the Philippines. We have a peace agreement with them already. And the third is the terrorist groups, uh, principally the Abu Sayyaf terrorist group. The Communist New People's Army and the Abu Sayyaf group are uh, declared terrorist organizations not only by the European Union, Union, but also of the United States. So for the first group, the Communist New People's Army, our desired effect is for them to abandon an armed struggle and to instead uh, engage in peace negotiations with the government as the MILF has done. And that is the second uh, threat group. Our desired effect is for a negotiated political settlement. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have achieved that. The third, the terrorist groups, principally the Abu Sayyaf group, were in the process of uh, focusing on this threat group right now. Again, the uh, focus is uh, on the long-term and more important effects of military operations on the people and the communities. This is principally done employing two strategic approaches. And these are the whole of nation approach, otherwise known as the whole of society approach, and the people-centered approach. And let me discuss each of these. First, the whole of nation approach. This is a natural progression of what we used to do, the whole of government approach. But we realize that it takes not just government to address these issues. It takes more than government, takes more than military solution to address these issues. It needs the involvement of the entire society, of the entire nation, if we are to address comprehensively the issues uh, that make or that fuel insurgency or terrorism. Involving all other agencies of government is not just about burden sharing. It's about having a shared concept of security, that all sectors of society have a shared concept of security, that they understand that anything that they do or don't do has impact on the collective security of all. And therefore, it needs the involvement of everybody, of all sectors of society. And the role of the armed forces is simply to catalyze the involvement of all these different stakeholders and to facilitate the synergy of the uh, collective effort of all these stakeholders. The second strategic approach is the people-centered approach. This is the, the, uh, the second major direct approach that we have to undertake if we are to achieve just and lasting peace. This is where the paradigm shift really is operationalized. It is uh, within the human security framework where it 
puts the people's welfare at the center of military operations, where the protection of the citizens, of each individual in itself, is an objective. And therefore, it gives primacy to human rights and uh, international humanitarian law and the rule of law. The people-centered approach is, in fact, an imperative. And let me discuss the two imperatives given these two, two strategic approaches. To be able to implement these uh, two strategic approaches, we have to not only involve our stakeholders, all our stakeholders in the pursuit of peace and security, but we must adhere to human rights, international humanitarian law, and rule of law if we are to effect the people-centered approach. These two strategic approaches and the two imperatives govern the four strategic concepts that we have under this, this plan. The first one, the first uh, of these strategic concepts is to contribute to the permanent and peaceful closure of all armed conflict. It means giving primacy to the peace process. We have a peace process uh, that we are implementing. And therefore, the military must be in support of this process, that everything it does is in support to the peace process and will not jeopardize the conduct of the peace process. Where military capabilities are employed only if merited by the security situation, and where it adheres to all the agreements of the cessation of hostilities. The military supports and advocates peace building discourses and also assists in the rehabilitation and reconstruction of conflict affected areas. But having said all of this, the main role of the military in this uh, peace process is to ensure that the threat groups are unable to use force or threaten the use of force as leverage in the negotiating table. The second strategic concept is the conduct of focused military operations. Focus in terms of addressing only the armed components of the threat group. For uh, many of us, we realize that threat groups, that these internal security threat groups involves not just armed components, but also unarmed. But these military operations has to be focused only on the armed component. And there should be zero tolerance on collateral damage. Now for these uh, threat groups, I mentioned three earlier, we have distinct methodologies. For the Communist New People's Army, the methodology is to exercise both social pressure and military pressure. We are all familiar with military pressure, the conduct of sustained military operations to go after the armed group. But equally important is social pressure. In this case, we have to operationalize the whole of nation approach or the whole of society approach, where all sectors of society exert pressure on the armed group to abandon armed struggle, where everybody speaks out against armed struggle and the importance of ending this armed struggle for the benefit of the entire society. These uh, insurgents or terrorists normally profess that they are fighting for the good of society, for the good of the people. And they thrive on popular support. But we have to demonstrate to them that there is no popular support for armed struggle, for the use of violence to achieve any political end. And that is what social pressure is all about. And it can be achieved by mobilizing, by motivating 
the entire nation, the entire society, all sectors, to impress upon these uh, threat groups that armed struggle, that violence is not the means to achieve political ends. For the second threat group, the uh, MILF, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, where we had a peace process. The methodology used was to, to demonstrate credible deterrence, to demonstrate to them that they cannot resort back to violence, that they have to continue negotiating and sit on that negotiating table until a resolution is achieved. Otherwise, military force can bear upon them. And we have to demonstrate that we are capable of defeating them. That there is no way except to continue the negotiation. For the third threat group, the terrorist Abu Sayyaf group, we are unequivocal about it. Our intent is to defeat them. Defeat them by isolating them. And by isolating them, we mean isolating them from international terrorist organizations that, so that they are not able to get support from them, isolating them from the other uh, threat groups in our country so that they are not able to radicalize them or get sanctuaries in, the, in, the, in their areas, isolating them from the communities so that they have no support and so that they have no sanctuaries to go to. And if we are able to isolate them, then it is we are then we are in a better position to defeat them militarily so those are the three distinct methodologies to address three distinct threat groups in the past we had a single template for all the threat groups but we realized that we have to address them differently with different methodologies the third strategic concept is to support community based peace and development efforts. Here we send out peace and development teams to the different barangays or villages. These teams are sent to these villages to live with the population and to be able to identify with them and to be able to surface the root causes of dissent. Why people join the armed struggle and we have to identify this, these issues that are radicalizing them, that are forcing them to join the armed struggle. And once we have identified these issues, and most of them are non-military, for instance, relative deprivation or marginalization, unequal economic opportunities, these are all non-military in nature and cannot be sold by the military. And so once identified, we have to bring in the appropriate agency of government or non-government organization to address these issues more comprehensively. The purpose is so that they are not radicalized to join the armed struggle. And once these are addressed comprehensively, then we, we can expect that uh, not only will the uh, threat groups be unable to gain support from the communities, but also they will not be able to recruit more members. And this is supported at the uh, provincial, regional level, as well as the national level. For the national level coordination, we have organized a whole of nation initiative task force. And this task force is composed of uh, members from the different cabinet and government agencies, as well as non-government organization. Incidentally, I was designated as the head of the, the whole of nation initiative uh, task force. Our task is really to support the conduct of peace and development initiatives in the 
barangay or village level. Helping our people down the line address these issues. Some of them are at the level of national issues and requires policy changes. For instance, uh, issue on, on mining, on ancestral domain of our indigenous peoples, our national level policy decisions that has to be made. Most of the issues are of the nature of land ownership and therefore must be addressed also at the national level. And so by ad addressing the uh, core issues of uh, radicalization of dissent, we are able to substantially contribute to the resolution of the armed struggle. The fourth and final strategic concept is security sector reform. Reform initiatives within the armed forces. These reform initiatives involves the development of capabilities of the armed forces, of the professionalization of its ranks, and also the institutionalization of stakeholders' involvement. We need to undertake reforms to elevate the armed forces on the moral high ground. We cannot implement this strategy unless the armed forces on the, is on the moral high ground. The whole of nation approach or the whole of society approach will not be implemented properly unless the armed forces is on the moral high ground. We cannot motivate, we cannot ask the others to help us if we are not on that moral high ground. And therefore, this is a very important aspect of the strategy, deliberately made part of the strategy. It takes a lot of credibility to be able to implement the whole of nation approach or the whole of society approach. And that is exactly the objective of this fourth strategic concept. But let me discuss how we are able to achieve this. Our vehicle for achieving this is the transformation roadmap of the armed forces. There are two trusts under this transformation roadmap. First is the development of capabilities and that is largely achieved through a modernization program and the professionalization of our personnel. And let me discuss this in more detail. The development of the military capabilities is not only about mission essential capabilities, it's also about developing the capability for interagency and stakeholder coordination. It is, this is important because note that this strategy is heavy on stakeholder coordination on interagency coordination to be able to achieve the whole of nation or whole of society approach. And also, we need to develop peace building capacities. Many of us are familiar already with the mission essential capabilities that we need to develop to be able to perform the mandated mission of military organizations. But the last two one, these are new territory as far as militaries are concerned, but are in essential if we are to be able to implement this strategy. The second major thrust is the professionalization of uh, our personnel, not only in terms of expertise in what they do, principally in the management of violence, but also good governance, being able to eradicate malpractices corruption, and other uh, accusations leveled against the armed forces in the past. We have to address these issues if we are to gain the credibility of our people. We have to be nonpartisan. In the past, the armed forces was involved in partisan activities, but 
you may have observed lately in the past several elections, including the last one, last May, this is one of the things that the armed forces has demonstrated. It's being nonpartisan, and it lends to the credibility of the armed forces. And finally, this I mentioned earlier, the adherence to human rights, international humanitarian law, and rule of law. Whereas in the past, human rights violations cases were thrown against the armed forces, but this has been largely addressed and it has its profound effect on the credibility of the armed forces. And so that is how we are able to achieve the moral high ground and be able to implement this strategy more efficiently and effectively. Now, given this plan, what have we realized so far? The gains under this uh, Bayanihan. First, in spite of the non-passage, the uh, temporary non-passage of the, uh, the law that, that uh, implements the uh, negotiated political settlement, peace with the MILF persists. We are in the process now of coming out with the appropriate legislation to institutionalize the peace agreement with the M MILF. We have signed a peace agreement with the MILF and this up to now holds and up to now we are still in the process of implementing this, the agreement, the peace agreement, the elements of the peace agreement. Secondly, as far as the Communist New People's Army, we have uh, normalized, let me correct this, this is not 48, this is, uh, as of today, 68 out of the 75 provinces have been normalized. When we say normalized, the threat level in those provinces have been reduced to a level where the local government is able to assume the responsibility for the security and peace in their uh, provinces. So to date, 68 out of the 75 provinces. We hope and we are very uh, confident that we should be able to normalize all of these provinces by end of the year, this year when the plan is supposed to be completed. And third, we have had unprecedented economic growth for the past several years already. And this is reflective of the peace and security conditions that allow economic growth and development to prosper. But more than this, uh, more than these uh, tangible gains are non-tangible gains that we realize. First, there is a growing peace constituency in our country, supporting peace process and the continuance of the peace agreement and other process and the processes with other threat groups. Secondly, there is popular support for our campaign. Third, there's much improved human rights record, specifically, specifically by the armed forces of the Philippines. And therefore, necessarily, there is change in how our people view the military. Again, this is very important in the whole of nation approach and the whole of society approach, achieving the moral high ground. Finally, let me just conclude by highlighting a few key learning points that, that we have uh, realized. First is the importance of the perspective of the security forces. And that perspective is winning the peace. This paradigm shift involved a lot of effort on the part of the leadership of the armed forces to convince that it is not just defeating the enemy that is the objective, as has been our military training. 
but more importantly, especially when we deal with our own people, it is winning the peace. Secondly, that security forces are important players in the quest for peace. No peace process will succeed without the support of the armed forces. After all, they are the frontliners here. And third, for us to be able to achieve the whole of nation or whole of society approach, there must be a shared concept of security where everybody understands their role. All sectors understand that their role. Every citizen understands that what they do or fail to do has impact on security, on the collective security of all of us. And finally, the importance of reform initiatives to elevate the armed forces on the moral high ground, which is very important if we are able to implement this plan. So thank you very much, and I am now open to any questions or clarifications.